Welcome to the house of the Lord. I'm Pastor David Rose now. God bless our time in his word. We'll begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. I'll offer the prayer of the day. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The word of God that is the foundation of our message today is recorded in the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 7. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. The word of our Lord. I'll offer a short prayer for the Lord to help focus our thoughts on the good he has for us in his word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. When Joseph Bell's mother walked past her four-year-old son's bedroom, she saw that he had stretched rubber bands connecting him to some knobs on his dresser and was plucking away at them, making noise. She thought, well, that's cute. But as she watched, she realized he was making the same sounds using those rubber bands that he had heard her play on the piano earlier. And that's when she started his violin lessons. (laughs) Ten years later, 14-year-old Josh Bell played with the Philadelphia Orchestra. At 17, he played Carnegie Hall. He's produced, I think, over 60 CDs by this time since then. He's one of the world's best violinists. But what would people need to see and hear to know how great he is? He agreed to an experiment. He played some of the most famous violin music on his favorite violin, a 300-year-old violin that was handmade by Antonio Stradivari. But he played it dressed in jeans and a t-shirt and baseball hat. And he played it outside a subway in D.C., Just nights earlier, he had sold out a Boston Symphony Hall. He makes thousands a minute when he's performing in concerts. More than a thousand people passed by in less than an hour as he was playing. Only seven paused to listen. Nobody would have ever said there was anything great about the nation of Israel, especially at its beginning. Israel was a man named Jacob who had 12 sons. 
A famine had devastated the land they were living in. And he needed to find food for himself and his sons and their families. God had promised a man named Abraham, Jacob's grandfather, that God would give him so many descendants they would be like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashores. That was hard to believe. He had 12 sons, but that was far from a great nation. But that was also before the famine and before the tragedy. Jacob didn't know all of the details. The only thing he knew was what his other sons had told him. He had lost his most precious son, Joseph, and what made the most sense to them, they said, the best they could piece together is that he had been killed by wild animals out in the field because they found his clothing torn and covered in blood. What else could explain that? Well, what else could explain that was the truth. And the truth was that Joseph's brothers couldn't stand him because they knew his father loved him most. So the truth was that they had sold their brother Joseph to some passing slave traders. And then they tore his clothing and dipped it in blood to make it look like he had been killed by a wild animal. But God worked through that tragedy and he used Joseph, who went from a simple slave to second in command of all of Egypt, to save Joseph's family, but also to keep his promise to grow Israel into a great nation. Because many years later, Jacob, who is also called Israel, sent his sons down to Egypt when he learned that they had grain for sale. Imagine Joseph's brother's surprise when they learned that Joseph was not only still alive, but also now in a position to do whatever he wanted to them. But in the forgiveness that only faith and trust in God can work in a human heart, Joseph said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what's now being done, the saving of many lives. Eventually, Joseph had his family move to Egypt. The Pharaoh gave them food and land, And over the next 400 years, that man and his 12 sons and their families grew into a great nation, just as God had promised. But over the course of those 400 years, one Pharaoh after the next forgot the innocent beginnings of the nation of Israel. The only thing they saw was that now they looked out and here's these millions of people. And they thought, If they continue to grow like this, they're going to get so powerful, they could overpower the Egyptian army. So the Pharaoh made them his slaves. But when the time was right, God sent Moses to lead Israel out of their slavery in Egypt and into the land that he had promised so long ago to Abraham. The promised land. But when he called Moses into action, Moses hesitated. He was 80. His brother was 83. What power were their words going to have with the king of Egypt? God told him that he would give him miraculous signs to show Pharaoh that it was not Moses who was asking Pharaoh to let Israel go. It was God telling Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses mentioned one of those miracles that we heard in this section from Exodus just a moment ago, that time when Aaron threw his staff down and it turned into a snake. Well, Pharaoh's magicians somehow copied that, but Aaron's snake swallowed up all of the other snakes, and then when Aaron grabbed it by the tail, it turned back into his staff again. Yet somehow Pharaoh did not see the greatness of God and the power of his word in that. God showed more, many more. The ten and terrible plagues, the parting of the waters of the Red Sea so that Israel could pass by on dry land, the closing in of those waters of the Red Sea on top of the Egyptian army and destroying them, 
God showed so much. Pharaoh saw so much. But he didn't believe in God and he didn't believe the power of his word. We know who God is. We know what God has done. We know he has all power. We believe he can do all things, anything, everything. But there are times when things happen in our lives when we wonder like Moses did, is today the day that God is going to use that power to help us? Is today the day that God is going to show us his power in a way that we can see it? Pharaoh didn't have any trouble seeing the miracles that were happening all around him. He didn't see or believe in the power of the word that was doing them. Because there was someone else who was keeping him from believing. There was someone else who was working so that he wouldn't believe. The devil didn't want Pharaoh to believe in the Lord. He didn't want Pharaoh to believe God's word. And he most certainly didn't want Pharaoh to be in heaven. That hasn't changed ever since. This happened 3,500 years ago, but it hasn't changed in any generation since then. The devil doesn't want you or me or anyone to believe in the Lord or in his word or in the power that he knows it has. Of course he doesn't want you or me or anyone to be saved. We know that of course he doesn't want us to be in heaven. But he's not content with that. Until we do go to heaven, he doesn't want us to see and believe in the greatness of our God and to trust in the power of his word because he knows what great comfort it has for us. And the hope that God gives to us through it and the peace and the joy and all of the other blessings that God works through it, like the incredible blessing of faith. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. There is power in this word to create faith in our hearts. That means there's also life in this word. No matter the devil, no wonder the devil wants to try to keep us from hearing it as often as he can. But no matter what he tries, And no matter what he does get away with, he can't take any of the power from it. And the same God who spoke through Moses and Aaron that day in Egypt, the same God who showed his power in miraculous ways then is the same God who took on human flesh to speak speak to us himself. That same God who showed his power in a most miraculous and merciful way on the cross. It might not have thundered in every person's soul that day, but when Jesus cried out from the cross, it is finished, he declared a most marvelous thing. When Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, cried out, it is finished, he declared that God's plan to deliver you and me from our slavery to sin is over. Our freedom had been won. Our victory had been accomplished. Life in the promised land of heaven was made possible. So what's been troubling you? What disturbs your rest and your sleep? What fills your thoughts? What fills your prayers? What are you hoping with all your heart that God will do for you? Don't doubt that God can do all things. Just because we don't see him doing it how or when or as quickly as we pray so earnestly he would. Look back at that cross and see all that he and the power of his word has done and has done for you. By his payment for all that we have done wrong, Jesus gives his word and we have life with him in heaven. So to the Lord and to his word we go. Again and again, for assurance, for peace, for strength, for hope, 
for reassurance for everything. God has shown us who he is from cover to cover in his holy word by what he has said and by what he has done. We see the greatness of our God and the power of his word in the grandest of ways and in the simplest. And yet he knows we can always use another reminder. Sometimes we are the ones who would like the Lord to show us in a miraculous way that he is with us that he does love us, that he is going to work a very troubling thing that's happening in our lives for our good because there are and there will be difficult things that we will endure as long as we are here. That happened with the disciples who were following Jesus too. Things got hard. Things were hard to understand. Things were hard to believe and some of them walked away from Jesus So Jesus asked the 12, are you going to leave me too? What would they need to see or hear to know how great he is? Peter spoke for all of them and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you, are the Holy One of God. Dear Christian, by God's grace and through the gift of faith that he has worked in our hearts, we know and believe that he is too. So in the good and the bad, in the easy to see his power and goodness kind of times, and in the times that we must be content to see by faith, to whom shall we go? Jesus has the words of eternal life. His word is power. So today, tonight, tomorrow, each new day that he gives us breath, to the Lord and to his word we go. Amen. I've got a short prayer for us today, and then after that, I'd like to ask you to please join together with me. We'll pray the Lord's Prayer together as we close. We pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know of your power. We have seen it displayed in grand ways and in small ways. Remind us of that, dear Lord. Help us to see that when the sun rises and when the sun sets, it's because you have told it to, then how much more? will you be working through your power to care for us too? You see what's happening in our country and in the world. Please, dear Lord, put your hand upon it in a way that only you can. Guide things, work things for good. Please watch over, protect, and guide all who are working and serving in our United States military and who are serving in public health and safety to keep us safe and free. For all of this and for so much more, we ask you in the name of Jesus who has taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for sharing your time. I thank God to think of you. I know so many who are joining me like this. God be with you. God bless you. God help you. And Lord willing, I'll see you real soon.